so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's a Wednesday morning in December 2018 and Hedley Thomas is running late, as per usual. The investigative journalist is on his way to audio producer Slade Gibson's studio to record more narration for the final episode of his podcast, The Teacher's Pet, which has been enjoying enormous success in the Australian and international podcasting charts. He's been trying to find out the truth about what happened to Sydney mother of two Lynette Dawson, who disappeared from her Bayview home in 1982. For six months and 16 episodes, he's tirelessly been piecing together the puzzle, placing Lynette's husband, Chris Dawson, at the centre of the story. Dawson claimed the last he saw of his wife was when he dropped her off at a bus stop one morning to go shopping. She was supposed to meet him and their girls that afternoon at Northbridge Baths, but she never turned up. He claims he took a phone call from her in the baths kiosk in which she told him she needed time away. She was never heard from again. Meanwhile, Dawson had been having an affair with a 16-year-old student from the school he taught at. He'd moved her into the marital home as a babysitter and once Lynn went missing, Jenny became the stand-in mum for his two young girls and eventually his second wife. Despite speculation, suspicion and unanswered questions about the disappearance of a loving, devoted mother and nurse from her family home, Dawson went on living his life unperturbed for three decades. In 2018, the Teacher's Pet podcast changed everything. And within a few short months, Hedley Thomas sat, shocked, at the other end of a phone line. Chris Dawson has just been arrested by police for the murder of Lynn. The caller said. A litany of lies helped bring him undone, but for 40 years he got away with it. Tonight, Chris Dawson is behind bars, a convicted murderer found guilty of killing his wife, Lynette. The prosecution case was based entirely on circumstantial evidence. Police have never found her body. This verdict is for Lynn. Today, her name has been cleared. She loved her family and never left them of her own accord. Instead, her trust was betrayed by a man she loved. It's the mystery that has consumed the nation, and today it reached its climax here in the New South Wales Supreme Court. But it's been a long time coming. When all this started, Chris Dawson was a footy star turned high school teacher with a young family. By the time the police charged him with his first wife, Lynn's murder, he was a grandfather aged in his 70s. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Hedley Thomas's Teacher's Pet podcast captivated the imaginations of millions of people around the world as he unravelled an Australian true crime story from a close-knit community on Sydney's northern beaches in real time, week by week. Over six months, he interviewed dozens of people, both in person and over the phone, and retrieved and read thousands of documents from the police brief of evidence, two prior inquests on the disappearance, and the archives of newspapers and high schools. He left no stone unturned in his quest to find answers for Lynette's family. As his meticulous investigations started to drop in people's podcast feeds, more evidence and information came to light. And for Chris Dawson, there was nowhere left to hide. Dawson's arrest in 2018 led to a high-profile murder trial in 2022, in which Headley found himself a witness. His podcast was removed from publication and his work heavily scrutinised throughout the court proceedings, with the defence accusing him of obstructing the administration of justice. To avoid any prejudice, a judge alone proceeded over the trial instead of a jury, and there was no denying his harsh assessment of the facts. 
He sentenced 74-year-old Dawson to 24 years for the murder of his wife Lynette 40 years after her death. I'm satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that the only rational inference that the circumstances enable me to draw is that Lynette Dawson died on about 8 January 1982 as the result of a conscious and voluntary act committed by Mr Dawson with the intention of causing her death. Christopher Michael Dawson on the charge that on or about 8 January 1982 at Bayview or elsewhere in the state of, Mur of New South Wales, you did murder Lynette Dawson. I find you guilty. Nearly a year on from the conviction, Headley has released a book of the same name, The Teacher's Pet, detailing a blow-by-blow -blow account of the crime, the podcast investigation and the courtroom drama. He joins me now. Headley, most Australians know the story of Lynette Dawson or Lynette Sims, as her family would like us to refer to her now, from your podcast, The Teacher's Pet, which was released in 2018. But when did you first come across her story and start reporting on it? Back in 2001, Gemma, and I heard about it because there was an inquest unfolding in Sydney at that time. I was working in Brisbane at the Courier Mail newspaper and I was a features writer there. And I was leafing through copies of the Daily Telegraph in the library room where we used to store all the papers from interstate and there were news reports of this inquest into the suspected death of Lynette Dawson, as we then called her. And the story was really intriguing me and then I discovered that the school teacher who was her husband, who was a possible killer, certainly suspected by police, had been a school teacher at my old high school on the Gold Coast after he left the northern beaches of Sydney. Now, already on file when you were starting to investigate this story, there was a 27-page statement from a woman called Jenny, which is the pseudonym you give in the book for one of the people in this case, the babysitter who Chris ends up marrying and having an affair with while Lynette is still alive. I want to you to take me back to reading that statement. How did you feel hearing her side of the story? I'd walked into a police station at DY. I'd made an arrangement with a copper called Damien Loon to meet him there and he had told me he would show me the material that was already tendered and had been heard in this inquest. And he left me in this back office of the police station with a box of documents. And that statement was one of those. And as I read it, and as I read the others, I was just so struck by the scale of this story and this case and what seemed to me a terrible injustice. An injustice because a young mother who had disappeared and been replaced almost immediately by a 17-year-old girl an injustice because that 17-year-old girl had, as a 16-year-old, been groomed and exploited by her high school teacher and had friends who had also been similarly groomed and exploited. And all of this material, I was reading in black and white. I hadn't met any of the people involved. I was really just going through the documentation and taking pages and pages of notes in 2001 and I remember walking out of that police station just blinking and just being completely blown away by the enormity of it and the touchstones that affected me then and which I didn't stop thinking about. Lynette was murdered in 1982. This is 2001. When had Jenny even made this statement? She'd made that statement in 1998. And she'd made her first police statement eight years earlier in 1990, soon after she fled Chris Dawson and their home on the Gold Coast where they had lived and begun raising their child, a little girl, Chris Dawson's third daughter. So was there a ongoing police case? Like where did the police situation sit when you've got this statement? as you say, you're reading it going, wow. And that's the amazing thing. For the first 
eight years after Lynn disappeared, there was really no police investigation other than just a few cursory missing persons checks and follow-ups. It was kicked down to the uniformed officers on the northern beaches and they weren't considering a possible murder even though the circumstances were so deeply suspicious right from the start. A loving mother, a loving wife suddenly vanishes and her two little girls who were just the absolute world to her, she'd had surgery so that she could conceive. She was desperate for years to have children and then she suddenly vanishes and is replaced within two days by the girl who had been the babysitter, the girl with whom her husband was infatuated. None of it really stacked up, but incredibly, the police failed to launch a murder investigation until Jenny, as we call her, returned from the Gold Coast. And in 1990, she made that statement to the police and said, I've got suspicions. I've left my husband because I'm worried for my own safety and I'm really concerned about the fate of the woman I replaced, Lynn. And she also met Lynn's brother. His name's Greg, Greg Sims, and she met Greg's wife, Marilyn, around the same time in 1990. And she tried to make contact with Lynn's mother, Helena, because she wanted Helena to understand her suspicions and concerns. Helena didn't feel like she could meet Jenny. She didn't want to meet her. It would have been really hard, and I think Helena blamed Jenny for what had happened. But she did ask her son, Greg, to meet her, and and that's what happened. And that triggered the first serious murder investigation, 1990. The statement that Jenny gave and then the conversations that she had with the brother and the sister-in-law and so on, that led to the police and the homicide squad taking a very keen interest. And that continued until late 1991. They don't work on it full time for two years, but they interviewed Chris back then on the Gold Coast. The detectives flew to the Gold Coast and had a recorded interview with him. And of course, he denied all the claims. He said that his estranged wife, Jenny, this very young woman who was 16 when Chris was 32 and her PE teacher, he said that it was just all part of her bitterness towards him after a a marriage that ended badly with her leaving him. And he said that his wife, Lynn, had just gone away, he thought, because initially she wanted some time to think things over. She was aware of his relationship with Jenny and he then suggested that perhaps she'd gone off with a cult, she'd gone to the Central Coast, she was with friends, he didn't know where she was. He had claimed that she'd contacted him several times by telephone over several weeks soon after she disappeared. But, of course, that was all part of the scheme, part of lying to try to throw people off. So early 2000s, you wrote some stories and there were some inquests, but by the time you pick the story back up again in 2017, Lynn is still missing, her body is still nowhere to be found, Chris is living his normal life... Nothing major had happened. Was this a story that stayed with you? What made you pick it back up in 2017? Yeah, look, it's a story that I thought about many times after 2001. I wanted to write a book about it back in 2001, 2002, because I thought it was so remarkable. And you're right, there was a second inquest. That one occurred in 2003. In both inquests, the coroners said, a known person should be prosecuted for murder over Lynn's disappearance. I find that Lynn is likely to have been murdered. She's dead. And they were talking about Chris. He was the known person. The DPP repeatedly refused to prosecute, not just in 2001 and in 2003, but through the years when... Damien Loon, who was a very dogged Northern Beaches detective, the one who let me read the files back Mm. in 2001, 
he kept on with it until 2015 and mm. tried very hard to interest the DPP in prosecuting the case. Each time he was rebuffed and they didn't want to know about it. So we get to 2017. It's late October 2017. I'd returned from a period of lengthy leave. My father had died earlier in the year and I wanted to revisit this case and try to do it as a very deep diving podcast investigation because I believe that it could be solved. And I thought a podcast would be the way to do it. If I could examine the case in all of its extraordinary detail and talk to former witnesses, talk to new witnesses who might come forward, talk to all the members of the family, Lynn's friends, talk to former school students, talk to former teachers, the heads of the school, former cops, current cops. I had a really long list of people I wanted to talk to. None of that would have been possible in its scale if I'd tried to do it as a print newspaper mm. journalist. But with a podcast, with multiple episodes and the length of time I could take to unpack this story, which was so troubling and daunting, I thought, we're in with the real shot to resolve this case. You went and asked your employer for six-ish months <laughs> to work on one thing, aka you're not actually producing something for six months, you're researching, you're building everything, and then you'll produce something at the end of six months. Did that take a lot of convincing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really fortunate that when I go to my bosses with an idea – they are usually very interested. They don't reject it straight away. Usually they don't reject it at all. They're pretty supportive. In fact, they are very, very supportive. And they also knew that I had a lot of conviction about this case. They knew that I wouldn't have come to them with this idea unless I really believed in it. And I've, over the years, put some runs on the board. You know, I haven't given them too many, if any, complete duds. So the stories that I've tried to tackle have been meaningful and have led to proper results or commissions of inquiry or findings that have vindicated the journalism. So I had that, I guess, head start. You have two personal correlations to this story that I'd love you to touch on if you feel comfortable. Firstly, your grandmother. And secondly, the Northern Beaches themselves. The Northern Beaches was a place I used to visit as a child when we lived in Canberra because my father had grown up on the Northern Beaches and he lived at DY and at Mona Vale and he had a sister at Narrabeen and so we would often spend weekends and school holidays there. But I also grew up knowing that my father's mother, so my grandmother, who lived on the northern beaches raising my dad and his sister and she was married, my grandmother suddenly disappeared when she was 35 years old. And you know, this was a really traumatic event in a young family's life and, and my dad found it difficult to talk about it and I know from my mother that Dad, for years, would look for his mother in a crowd of people in a shopping centre or walking on the street. He would just try to find his mother's pretty face and, of course, he never did. I knew, too, that it was believed she had committed suicide by walking down to the water's edge at DY Beach and just swimming out to sea and there was nobody ever recovered. But I didn't really understand much more about it. And I didn't want to deal with that in the podcast. It was, I guess, something I held pretty close. I'm very confident that it was an underlying driver for the commitment and the powerful interest that I had in Lynn's disappearance. It is an extraordinary coincidence. And of course, it's completely unrelated. They're yeah. very different events. But similar age, children. Yeah. And I confided it to a couple of people 
while I was developing the podcast, not believing that it would ever become publicized or anything. And when I had to hand over all of my documents to Chris Dawson's legal team and the police and so on, in an email that I had written, it was mentioned. And I think that's when Chris Dawson's side realized that this really meant something to me. It was an emotional weakness. It was potentially an explanation for why I had picked up this case, why I had driven it with an intensity and a level of probable obsession that was a bit unusual. And it wasn't because I was trying to vindicate or prosecute anything in relation to my grandmother's disappearance. I expect that she did swim out to sea and that there was nothing suspicious about it. Two of her siblings had committed suicide. There was a history of depression or trouble in that regard, but I didn't know. I didn't know, and my father had died seven months before I decided that this was the podcast that I was going to do. It's quite likely, although I don't remember having this conscious thought, that I waited until my father died before starting the teacher's pet investigation because I think it would have distressed him being reminded of this trauma in his own childhood. I think it's quite common for journalists to move towards things that mean something to them, but I guess like listening to the podcast when you put it out, you would never have known any of that. So thank you for sharing. How did you regain Lynette's family's trust when you kind of picked that story back up in 2017? Because at the time, they'd already been having kind of lengthy conversations with another journalist, Rebecca. Yeah, they had been in touch with Rebecca, who was writing her book. And Rebecca's a lovely and incredibly talented writer who I got to know well, but I didn't know her when I first approached the Sims family. I'd had contact with Rebecca, though. She had emailed me in 2012, and she'd emailed me out of the blue because she had found the feature article that I wrote in 2001, this feature article that was informed by all of this very rare detail that I'd been given access to in the DY police station by Damien Loon after the first inquest had ended. And Rebecca, being a diligent researcher for her book, had come across that article and said, oh, I've read all this material that I've never seen before. In that piece you wrote, I'm writing a book and that's how we connected for the first time. So then we get to late October 2017 and before I contacted the Sims family, I went back and looked for the email that I knew I'd received from Rebecca years earlier when she told me she was writing this book. I'd not seen her book. And I thought, well, if she's written a book, then that'll be a really handy baseline document for me to devour before I start my podcast. And if she hasn't written her book or if a book is written but not yet published, perhaps we can team up and I can involve her in my podcast and who knows, we might be able to get her book published as well. So I had this idea that we could collaborate and I rang her and she was at an airport. She was flying to Melbourne and she remembered me from five years earlier and she said, I've finished my book but I haven't had it published. I'm looking for a publisher. And I said, oh, that's amazing. I'm going to do a podcast, touch wood. I just need approval internally. <laughs> Maybe we can work together and, you know, I could talk to people that you've talked to and if I find new people, they can be part of your book. And anyway, she was immediately attracted to the idea and that's when I contacted Greg Sims and his wife Marilyn and Pat Jenkins, Lynn's sister, and I had met Pat back in 2001 and I had stayed in touch with Pat over the years through email and the occasional phone call as she updated me on developments or the lack of developments, I had that relationship already. And when they were comfortable that I wasn't going to burn Rebecca, that I wanted to work with Rebecca, they were really keen and committed. And Rebecca and I struck up a really nice rapport and we're very good friends and we work together well. And in fact, within hours of that phone call with her in 2017, she was sending me huge chunks of her unpublished manuscript 
we had no agreement in place, but there was just this immediate and instinctive trust that we developed. It was about six months until you released episode one. How did you find that six months? Was it frustrating, enjoyable, hard, (laughs) all of the above? (laughs) It was gruelling, but incredibly satisfying. I spent many, many days, weeks, reading hundreds and then ultimately thousands of pages of material. And I have a method where I really want to gather as much documentary material, witness statements, transcripts, letters, previous articles, any television programs, the video and audio from radio, anything I can get. I want to gather everything that might be available in the public sphere from a case that I'm investigating before I start doing interviews because I want to understand all of the details. I want to bury myself in the nitty-gritty and that way I'll be much better informed for an interview. I'll know what the chronology of events is. I'll remember, hopefully, what the witness, the person I'm interviewing, has previously said to the police. And that way... If I get a response that's slightly different or is new, I can further develop that. And if someone perhaps wants to lie to me, I know what they've previously Mm. said, so I can jump on that too. It took a long time to gather that material, but I felt comfortable that I had enough. So then we started the interviewing and Rebecca and I in Sydney, when we caught up, we would drive around in her big BMW and she was this very diminutive figure in a designer suit and she's an author and she's an ocean swimmer and a lawyer and so I would jump into her car at her place at Manly or she'd pick me up at the hotel and then we'd go from one of Lynn's friends houses to another one to another one and we'd be talking all the way about different angles and different features of the the story and our interpretation of some of the events and it was a really nice time I loved that part of it I think I liked it so much and I think because I was so daunted by the scale of the story and my uncertainty about how you actually do a podcast Mm. and how you write for a podcast that I put off for the longest time the other hard part of sitting down and writing chapter one, episode one of The Teacher's Pet. I just (laughs) kicked that can down the road for as long as possible until I had a laptop that was just almost filled with hundreds of gigabytes of audio and other material relating to this case, but I hadn't scripted anything. You do say in your book that you felt intimidated to put Mm. pen to paper. I can't imagine what it would feel like to have that much information, like six months' worth of information swimming around in your brain. How did you decide where to start? You're right. It was really intimidating not just because of the amount of information, but because of what I had come to realise even more than I did in the beginning in 2001. The scale of the injustice, Mm. the seriousness of it, the failure of the authorities and the hideous betrayal of Lynn by Chris, the cruelty inflicted on Lynn's daughters being raised with this lie that you know, your mother didn't love you enough and that's why she left. I worried that I couldn't properly do justice to all of that and that was another reason for postponing it and just going back out on the road and doing more (laughs) interviews and finding more people. When finally I decided, that's it, I've got to stop and start writing. Were there any interviews that you were nervous before jumping into? I was really nervous when I went to interview Chris Dawson. It was too early to have a single shot of whiskey. (laughs) (laughs) What were you nervous about? I knew by then I had a pretty firm idea then that he was a murderer. I also knew that he hated me from the article that I had written in 2001 Mm -hmm. that really shone a bright light on what he had been involved in with schoolgirls on the northern beaches. And I knew from his daughter Chanel that he was furious that I was doing a podcast investigation. He, I think, had an instinctive belief that if he was going to be in serious trouble for this murder committed in 1982, 
it would probably be because of the journalism that I might do because the story I wrote in 2001 was very, very damaging for him. He ended up losing his job as a teacher. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it, that he was even allowed to teach again, let alone be teaching at an all-girls school in Queensland. And Chanel said he was worried even back then. I think all of that made me anxious too about how that interview or conversation might unfold. It was a mercifully brief conversation. He had little to say. He said he remembered me, he knew of me, knew what I was doing, was that effect. But he'd lost all of his faith in journalists and journalism, so he wouldn't be agreeing to any interview. And I tried to tell him that, look, this is a podcast, I'll give you an unedited interview. So we can talk for an hour and I won't even edit what you say or what I say. It can just go as recorded, but he'd hung up on me. Hi, Chris speaking. Oh, g'day, Chris. My name's Hedley Thomas. Uh, I'm a journalist. Oh, Hedley, I know, I know of you, yes. Chris, I'd really like to have a chat to you in your views on this. Um, Hedley, I've spoken to journalists before and articles and television shows have been coming out and have not been fair in my um, interpretation of what I've said. Totally changed everything I have said. I'm sorry, I, I've lost all my faith in journalism. So... Um, I mean, the one thing... Yeah, so, 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 sorry, my, my answer is, is no, I, I won't be speaking to you, sorry. Chanel did tell me, though, that after that interview, he broke his phone and she believes that it was a reaction. That's actually quite scary. That shows that menacing side. Yeah, and I don't know if he did definitely break his phone because of the interview, but she was suspicious that that's what had happened. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with Gold Walkley Award-winning journalist Hedley Thomas about his new book, The Teacher's Pet. For Teacher's Pet Junkies, I want to touch on a few more behind-the-scenes things. Mm. Tell me about your audio engineer, Slade Gibson. Oh, Slade. (laughs) (laughs) You spend a lot of time together. Yeah. Slade is just a legend. And I didn't know really what audio engineers would do or could do because I didn't know what a podcast was capable of doing. And I met Slade because I went to his studio at his house in Brisbane, about a 20 minute drive from mine, to do a, an audio trailer. He wasn't assigned to be the audio engineer for my podcast. I was to have worked with somebody else who already worked for our organization. And I met Slade and we got on really well and he started asking me questions about the story and the case and we had to do another one. And the more I talked to him, the more I appreciated the depth of his own wisdom and he had a an angle and a way of seeing a lot of the really – concerning and troubling features of this case and this story that for me was incredibly helpful because I had views and some of my views, they weren't very well developed or they hadn't been properly informed by things that Slade understood. And I don't know how he understood them. He hasn't lived longer than me. (laughs) You know, he hasn't had any kinds of experiences, to my knowledge, that would give him this knowledge. But he just had an insight, an intuitive instinct about different parts of the case and and the people he was hearing. The more he heard in terms of their audio, the more he seemed to just get different personalities and, and events and angles. And it helped enormously. And we formed a fantastic partnership and the hours were grueling, the challenges became almost impossible because we were developing an episode a week from scratch after the first half a dozen or handful, and poor Slade just, he was up for it every time until right near the end when 
you know, I swear he was hiding under the bed. <laughs> Running would, out of steam. <laughs> when I would drive down his long driveway and we had to take a pause after 14 episodes. We were both completely shattered and he looked pale. He had to manage so much though. Like the edits for episodes that were a minimum of an hour and 20 that had many, many different tracks and he was writing all the music as well. He was having to make you know, hundreds of cuts and trims and little edits, you know, as we would be close to releasing an episode. He was trying to smooth and make audible this terrible audio that I would turn in. <laughs> I'd had no lessons on how to get levels right and, you know, I still am pretty hopeless on that stuff. And I didn't have time to to develop the kind of sophisticated audio that you would expect to hear in a really polished podcast. The teacher's pet isn't polished. The teacher's pet, it's raw. Mm. It's happening in real time. I'm so busy during the teacher's pet investigation in 2018 that I'm driving in my car from my home to meet someone for an interview and on the drive I've got my little recording device on the dashboard of the car for another interview to save a bit of time so that I could just quickly grab that audio and work out what to use of it, send it to Slade. It was insane, but we had to maintain that pace and I couldn't have done it without Slade. There's no way I, I think anybody else would have been able to keep up and, and would have been still capable of producing that amazing music and, and getting it out on time. Because you've already touched on it, I'd love to talk a bit more about what your life looked like in those 14 episodes, in those 14 weeks. Did you sleep? Were you ever at home? Like, what did it look like? <laughs> I was travelling a lot in the period leading up to when I needed to start writing. I was in Sydney many times. I was in Newcastle. I drove out to country towns to interview people. I was busy doing that, but then when it came time to start writing, I took over the dining table at home and it just became strewn with folders and my laptop and thumb drives and other paraphernalia. So my wife, Ruth, and, and my two children, you know, they would often just say, Dad, when are we going to get the table back? And I'd just push it down one end. It took a toll for sure. Like my partner Ruth has been an amazing journalist and and incredibly supportive and you know she was pregnant with our daughter when I first heard about Lynn and Chris in 2001 and you know she backed it all the way but we found because of the stresses on us that it almost ruined our marriage we came very close to I think separating during the teacher's pet, and I'm so glad that we were able to sort of you know, claw our way back from the brink. Do you remember when that first episode went live? Were you expecting what happened? I didn't know what to expect, and I didn't know how soon we would see any kind of reaction or whether there even would be any reaction. I, I had no idea what would happen I just knew that the story had a massive impact on me and whenever I talked to people about the story, whenever I explained what had happened and went through it, friends who are journalists and friends who have nothing to do with journalism, they were all completely captivated by it. You know, at social gatherings or over a glass of wine with really close friends and I would explain what I was trying to work on you could have heard a pin drop because people were sort of just wide-eyed, mouths open as I explained what had happened in this case and how for so many years police had failed to do anything and then did do good work but prosecutors wouldn't do anything and then there was this babysitter who became the second wife and, you know, it was people thought it was just insane. Like, as Pat Jenkins, Lynn's sister, said, if it was a movie – People would say, that's ridiculous. It's just too far-fetched. Mm. But it was true. To put it lightly, the podcast went nuts. 
Well, it was a podcast that captured Australia's attention. The teacher's pet downloaded more than 50 million times, shining a light on Lynette Dawson's disappearance. That renewed focus, leading to a lengthy trial and ultimately the guilty verdict for Chris Dawson. All over the world, everyone was listening to the teacher's pet live because you were doing it week by week by week. Looking back, do you feel proud? I feel incredibly privileged to have had an opportunity to not just take on an amazing, remarkable case and turn it into a piece of journalism that makes a big difference. We're still here talking about it. It's been almost five and a half years since that podcast was launched and we have a guilty killer, a pedophile. That you helped put behind bars. He's in Long Bay. He'll be there until he dies. Now, you know, that is something I, I don't celebrate, the fact that he's there. People who still love him, one of his daughters, for example, at least one of his daughters, and other people close to him, they no doubt say he's an innocent man, wronged and, and completely destroyed by reckless journalism. I think that that is ridiculous, that evidence is so powerful, his motive and his behaviours so obviously pointing to his guilt. But I don't think it would have happened. I don't know for sure what prosecutors were going to do in the absence of a podcast. Most people I talk to say nothing would have happened if it hadn't been for the teacher's pet because prosecutors had for so many years and over a number of different occasions when presented with the brief said, no, we're not prosecuting. And they very rarely reverse a previous decision. I do want to touch on the court case a little bit. Did you have it in the back of your head, the legalities of doing a story like this or a podcast like this? Was that something that you were conscious of, worried about, thinking about? Very conscious of it. And we took a lot of advice legal advice from very skilled defamation lawyers. Our defamation lawyer, John Paul Cashin, who has helped me from the very start with this case and many other cases, he spelled it out early on and he said, look, we're effectively accusing this man who has no prior convictions of murder and that could have consequences. Of course, he has remedies for defamation. But we took the view that it was all or nothing with this case, that a terrible wrong had been committed. He'd got away with murder. And if he wanted to sue us, we would defend it in court in a civil proceeding and we would plead truth and we would seek to prove that he was a murderer. And of course, as a litigant suing us, he would have to give evidence. He would be under oath. We would have been able to cross-examine him on everything including the grooming and sexual exploitation of schoolgirls, not just the schoolgirl he would go on to marry, but others as well, involving others with whom he was close. You did end up going from being a journalist in this story to a witness. What was that experience like? Well, yeah, I didn't look forward to that. (laughs) I still look back on it with equal parts of trauma and... (laughs) Not surprised. I had almost three full days in the witness box during the stay proceeding in the Supreme Court in 2020. Not many people know about that. The podcast was really going on trial. Mm, It was. Chris Dawson's pathway to freedom after he was charged, he believed, lay in showing that he could not get a fair trial because I was a dreadful, biased and vindictive journalist who had gone after him and contaminated all the witnesses by talking to them and so on. So that was the play and he spent a lot of money on lawyers and a lot of time in several courts trying to demonstrate that fact. That necessarily meant that I had to give evidence. I had to be cross-examined by his silk and we had some robust exchanges. I took the view that They were coming for me, fair enough. I'd effectively accused him of murder, so why wouldn't he have a swing? But if I was going to 
die, I'd rather die on my feet and I wasn't going to make the sorts of concessions that they wanted me to make because they weren't true and I wanted to defend the journalism. I didn't want to shrink from what I'd done. I wanted to own it and try to, again, maintain this belief that I've always had that the system failed, Lynn. So now what the system, the same legal system, criminal justice system was going to accuse me <laughs> of doing the wrong thing, get real. Yeah. No, this is what journalists do. And, you know, we must have the freedom to be able to explore and develop these stories accurately. I wasn't accused of getting anything wrong in the podcast, just of being a bit mean, <laughs> far too mean. What happened after he was charged in terms of the podcast? So he was charged in December 2018 and in early 2019, the organisation, my employer, The Australian, we took the view on legal advice that because he had a trial pending, we should take down, only in Australia, the Teacher's Pet podcast. Mm -hmm. And that was so that potential jurors who heard it would not be adversely affected the evidence in the podcast is overwhelming and there's a lot of opinions of people who have been absolutely certain of Chris Dawson's guilt and say that. And all of that material for defence lawyers, you know, it's like plutonium. They hate it. And so they were obviously supportive of that podcast coming down, but there was no way we were going to take it down across the world. We didn't need to. It was only in the Australian jurisdiction that we did that. Then, after Chris Dawson was convicted at the end of August 2022, we re-released the podcast and I narrated it all over again. It was a whole new narration. And oh my I, gosh. I needed to do that because <laughs> some things had changed in terms of not the facts of the original podcast. That didn't change. It was because of some legal issues that arose as a result of the woman we're calling Jenny bringing her own actions and as a result of that there are laws that prevent us from identifying her. So the original podcast sounds a little bit different because we've taken some names out. You didn't actually go to Chris Dawson's murder trial because you were a witness. Because you'd spent so long on this story, was that hard not to be able to go? Yeah, look, it was a little bit frustrating at times, but I also felt that my colleagues were covering it really carefully. They were doing a great job. I was still involved because after I'd been quarantined from the actual evidence, I was able to assist with the teacher's trial podcast series that we did for the duration of the trial. And I think I also felt like the pressure was off me a little bit. I didn't feel comfortable sharing the limelight in the trial, I, I wanted it to be about the evidence, not me. So it was good to just step away from it. Plus, I was really busy with another podcast investigation. And, you know, if I'd just been in the trial covering it or following it and doing a little bit of coverage, it probably wouldn't have been, you know, a really good use of my own time. So it was, it was good the way it worked out. I certainly went for the verdict and... I sat with Greg and Marilyn. Paul Dawson was sitting directly behind me. As you know, you probably remember Justice Ian Harrison mm -hmm. took a long time. A very long time. I was covering it live for Mamma Mia, so I listened to the whole thing as well. And I don't know about you, but I didn't know which way he was going to go. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> he is a masterful storyteller yes. too, right? <laughs> he injected perhaps not knowingly, a lot of suspense into that delivery. I think there were some early indications that really? Chris was done for because very early in his judgment, Justice Harrison said that Lynn Dawson was dead and that she died on or around 8th, 9th of January 1982. And that was at odds with what Chris had been claiming all of this time. He said that he'd had contact with her, she'd telephoned him, he'd put that in his written statement, he'd said that in a videotaped interview in 1990. So as soon as Justice Ian Harrison said 
she was dead, then Chris was a liar. And if Chris was a liar, then how could he be believed on everything else? So there was a big tell there, but the judge was not spelling it all out. So you had, Lee, this is why you're the pro. You already knew. <laughs> did you feel relief when that sentence came through or what did you feel? A relief and I think sadness mm. that had come to this. You know, it was 40 years, 40 and a half years after Lynn disappeared and we got this verdict and it's a verdict that, that should have happened 40 years ago. And I thought for the people who had endured so much pain until they saw justice, they didn't deserve that. The system should have done better. Police should have done a lot better. The prosecutors should have taken this case up, in my view, much earlier. Chris Dawson lived the best years of his life as a free man. Yes, he would have the occasional tabloid TV journalist thrusting a camera in his face and you know being ambushed from time to time by you know, a current affair or whatever, and then having to deal with a podcast investigation. But he was able to go through his 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and retire mm. to the beach. And, you know, Lynn, where is she? We don't know. There was no justice for her for a very long time. And for Lynn's family and dear friends, many of them must have thought, well, we're going to die and this bastard will get away with it. So, you know, I think the right result undoubtedly was reached, but it was a long time coming. You did mention, you know, it's been five years since you kind of started the podcast. We are still talking about it. You've now released a book on it. But do you still think about Lynn, about her family, about, you know, what happened? Is that still something that you think about often? Yeah, I do. And I'm really good friends with Lynn's family. I catch up with Greg and Marilyn. We talk a lot. I speak to Pat all the time. I've got a nice relationship with Chanel, other members of the extended family I'm close to. And they talk to me a lot about Lynn and I learn something every time we chat. And Sometimes they'll say something and I think, oh, God, I wish I'd known that for the podcast <laughs> or for the book. You're holding back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful relationship and I think we'll be friends forever, certainly until I drop and I'm really grateful. I mean, they've been wonderful supporters and we're tight and, you know, I don't think it affected my objectivity when you meet a really decent, honest family and you know that they're telling the truth, and you know that because you've read everything that they've previously said. You hear them saying the same things. Their story doesn't get embellished or exaggerated. They're just good, truthful people. And then you look at someone like Chris Dawson, and he's just a sociopathic, narcissistic liar and a killer. Thanks to Headley for assisting us to tell this story. You can find The Teacher's Pet, the podcast and the new book linked in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted and produced by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with another True Crime Conversation.